Welcome to the First Unitarian Church of Worcester, Massachusetts. Happy Easter, everybody. I'm Sarah Stewart. I'm the minister here. It is wonderful to have all of you with us this morning. I'm leading worship this morning with our director of music, Allegra Martin, our director of faith development, Samantha Namath, our assistant director of music, James Haupt, our assistant director of faith development, Abigail Hannaford Riccardi, and our broadcast tech, Eugene Rossi. Kate Sheehan is our head usher, and Tom Dings is volunteering as our camera operator. We're very pleased to have two guest musicians with us this morning, Bruce Hopkins, who you heard on trumpet during our prelude and will continue to play trumpet throughout the service, and William Ryan on violin, our young artist in residence. Wonderful to have you both with us. Speaking of music, there is so much wonderful music in the service today. Try your hardest to contain your applause until the end of the service. We'll finish with uh, our hallelujah chorus and our postlude, and after both of those are great opportunities for applause and showing your joy in response to the music. Here at First Unitarian Church, we strive in loving fellowship to honor the sacred, connect with each other, and serve justice. We are a welcoming congregation, whatever your age, race, class, or nationality, you are welcome here. Single people and families of all kinds are welcome here. LGBTQ folks are welcome here. Those of all physical and mental abilities are welcome here. The doors of this church are open to all, and we are delighted you are with us today. Welcome to those of you who are joining us online. You can like this video to help others find it and subscribe to our channel to find more content. The best way to stay in touch with everything we do together as a church is to subscribe to our newsletter. You can go to firstunitarian.com and click subscribe to the newsletter at the bottom of any page. And if you're in the Worcester area, I invite you to join us at 1030 every Sunday for worship and fellowship at 90 Main Street. Everyone is welcome to come to a social hour in the church parlor after the service through either of these doors at the front of the sanctuary. And this door on my left is the accessible entrance. If you're a newcomer, please stop by the welcome table, which is over on this side of the church parlor. There are volunteers who can answer questions. We have a gift bag for you. You can also sign up for the newsletter and a name tag there. There are announcements in your order of service, and I have a few additional announcements. During March, uh, your worship team has been finding music and words written by women to honor Women's History Month. And I want to highlight a woman named Ethel Porter, a 20th century musician and composer. She wrote the descant that you'll hear during Jesus Christ is Risen Today, our opening hymn. And she and her husband, Hugh, were the editors of the red hymnal that's in your pews, the 1958 Pilgrim Hymnal. We'll be hearing her music today. And then finally, after the service, we have our Easter egg hunt. Uh, during the service, our teenagers will be out there hiding the eggs in the most devilish places that they can find in the garden. And after the service, young children, let's see, pre-K um, up through grade five are invited to join in the Easter egg hunt. Thank you to everybody who brought in eggs and put money in eggs. The money um, in the eggs is donated to a charity the children chose, which I think is the Worcester Area Rescue League. Yes. So after the Hallelujah Chorus, we will invite those young families to go out and begin the Easter egg hunt, and the rest of us will stay in the sanctuary and listen to the postlude. This is the day the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. The green of Jesus is breaking the ground, and the sweet smell of delicious Jesus is opening the house and the dance of Jesus' music has hold of the air, and the world is turning in the body of Jesus, and the future is possible. Amen. Helena and Sophia are lighting our chalice this morning.
in the spirit of love. We light this chalice. Please rise in body or spirit to renew the covenant of this church with the words in your order of service and appearing on your screen. In the love of truth and in the spirit of Jesus, we unite for the worship of God and the service of all. number 268 in your gray hymnals, Jesus Christ is risen today. Good morning. 
next Sunday on April 7th, First Jew is helping host uh, Lorcana trading card tournament. And on that day, it's going to be running from 2 to 7 p.m. So if anyone wants to help volunteer and let the comers to our church know what we're about or to sell concessions, please come see me. Also, we created a novelty First Jew Lorcana trading card. So it's amazing. And if you come, you will get one, but they're open to everybody. On April 21st, we have a parent info session. We are hosting our Our Whole Lives Human Sexuality class for fourth through sixth grade. And those classes will be running on April 27th from 10 to 1 and May 4th, 10 to 1. If you want to learn more about what Our Whole Lives is all about, please come see me and we will be more than happy to explain everything about it. It's a wonderful program. Our facilitators are amazing and it's really super enriching. Also next Sunday is the last day for our Bicoda, which is our middle school youth group food drive for the Cardi Cupboard. There are posters throughout the dining room and the Bancroft room to see what the Cardi Cupboard needs. So please take a moment to look and help support the Cardi Cupboard and our Bicoda youth group's food drive. Today's story is written by Abby, and it's called Change is Difficult, the story of a caterpillar's transition to butterfly. <clears throat> we all love butterflies, but did you know that the caterpillar's old body actually dies inside the chrysalis before a new body with beautiful wings appears? Butterflies go through a life cycle of four stages, egg, larva, pupa, and adult. The pupa stage, which takes place inside what's called the chrysalis, is not, as some think, a resting stage. There is no structural similarity at all between a caterpillar and a butterfly. A caterpillar spends most of its time eating. In time, hormonal changes occur, and the caterpillar loses interest in feeding. It finds a sheltered, safe spot and forms what we call a chrysalis. Some chrysalis hang upside down, but others support themselves on tree branches or create a silk hammock. Changes inside the chrysalis are slow and gradual. The caterpillar is attacked by the, some sort, by the same sort of juices that it used earlier in its life to digest food. The caterpillar's body actually digests itself from the inside out. Inside the chrysalis, the caterpillar, unable to move, actually dissolves into organic goop. During the first three to four days, the chrysalis is a little bag filled with rich fluid. Cells, which had been dormant in the caterpillar and which biologists call imaginal cells, begin a process of creating a new form and structure. The cells use the fluid to grow and to form a new body. At, the, at first, these imaginal cells operate independently. The caterpillar's immune system regards the imaginal cells as threats and attacks them, but they persist, multiply, and connect with, e with each other. The imaginal cells form clusters and clumps and begin resonating at the same frequency and passing information back and forth until they hit a tipping point. They begin not acting as a discrete individual cells, but as a multi-cell organism. The chrysalis loses nearly half of its weight because of this process consuming energy. A couple days before the butterfly emerges, the chrysalis changes color. The butterfly's pattern and color can be seen through the chrysalis. As a butterfly begins to emerge, it releases a chemical which plays a vital role in strengthening its wings. The movements inside the chrysalis help pump fluid into the wings, allowing them to expand. If a well-meaning human sees the butterfly struggle and tries to help it by opening the chrysalis, the butterfly's wings will be too weak and it will die. The butterfly's struggle to break free from the chrysalis is critical for its development. The butterfly breaks out of the protective chrysalis and pumps blood into its newly formed wings and flies away. Just like the butterfly, we cannot skip the icky stuff. 
Change is indeed difficult, but each of us must go through life struggles in order to soar. Thank you. I'd like to invite all my friends, sixth grade and up, you're gonna go in with Abby to hide all the eggs. And if you're in fifth or below, you can come with me and do some crafts while we, before the egg hunt. Thank you. Please join me in the common prayer printed on the insert in your order of service and appearing on your screen. Holy One, love, life with us, bloom and grow in our hearts this Easter morning. Roll away the stones of despair, 
and through love make them the building blocks of compassion. Leave behind all that has died in us and let us walk again on the green earth as people whose powers touch the powers of the world. Let the pain of our wounds be to us a reminder to be gentle with ourselves and others. Give us a sturdy hope, a useful joy, laughter on the road, the renewal of life in our hearts, the companionship of the holy, the presence of friends, and the sure knowledge that we live always in love. Amen. Please continue your own thoughts and prayers in silence. In this time of prayer and meditation, we share the joys and sorrows of our church with one another. Vicki Hardy lights a candle of gratitude for all the prayers and support. She is finally on the mend. We hold this prayer of gratitude and healing in our hearts, and we know there are those joys and sorrows which go unspoken among us. So we hold one another in compassion as we say together the prayer of Jesus. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Our ministries at First Unitarian Church thrive because of your support. In the last week, just this morning, 36 of us gathered at Bancroft Tower for our annual Easter sunrise service. We are running a pilot project to invite Haitian refugee families to cook in our kitchen on Mondays so that they can have healthy food for their families as they are living in a hotel. And right as we speak, our youth are hiding dozens of eggs for our children to find after the service, with the money inside the eggs going to the Worcester Animal Rescue League. The ushers will receive this morning's offering, or you may scan the QR code in your order of service. If you're online, you can text the number on your screen or go to firstunitarian.com and click Give Online at the top of any page. Everything we do as a church is thanks to your support. I invite your generous contributions for the good work of First Unitarian Church.
As she wept, she bent over to look into the tomb, and she saw two angels in white sitting where the body of Jesus had been lying, one at the head and the other at the feet. They said to her, woman, why are you weeping? She said to them, they have taken away my Lord and I do not know where they have laid him. When she, said, when she had said this, she turned around and saw Jesus standing there, but she did not know it was Jesus. Jesus said to her, woman, why are you weeping? Whom are you looking for? Supposing him to be the gardener, she said to him, Sir, if you have carried him away, tell me where you have laid him, and I will take him away. Jesus said to her, Mary. She turned and said to him in Hebrew, Rabuni, which means teacher. Jesus said to her, Do not hold on to me, because I have not yet ascended to the Father. But go to my brothers and say to them, I am ascending to my father and your father, to my God and your God. Mary Magdalene went and announced to the disciples, I have seen the Lord. And she told them that he had said these things to her. When it was evening on that day, the first day of the week, and the doors of the house where the disciples had met were locked for fear, Jesus came and stood among them and said, peace be with you. After he said this, he showed them his hands and his side. Then the disciples rejoiced when they saw the Lord. Jesus said to them again, Peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, so I send you. When he had said this, he breathed on them and said to them, Receive the Holy Spirit. Our second reading is the poem, Blessings, by Ronald Wallace. Blessings occur. Some days I find myself putting my foot in the same stream twice, leading a horse to water and making him drink. I have a clue. I can see the forest for the trees. All around me, people are making silk purses out of sow's ears getting blood from turnips, building Rome in a day. 
There's a business like show business. <laughs> There's something new under the sun. Some days, misery no longer loves company. It puts itself out of its. There's rest for the weary. There's turning back. There are guarantees. I can be serious. I can mean that. You can quite put your finger on it. Some days I know I am long for this world. I can go home again. And when I go, I can take it with me. We are so used to tumbling into the future without thinking about it. This moment becomes the next and the next, and so much of our lives are taken up with habit and schedule, we just step into that next moment without giving it any thought. But Easter is a moment to stop and think. The crisis of death, the miracle of resurrection, it should give us pause. How dare we? step into the future? What if there's nothing there? What if there's nothing underneath our feet? The promise of Easter is the promise of a future that will hold us and invite us into our goodness, even though we will experience loss along the way. I have shared with some of you that my mother has Parkinson's disease. She was diagnosed 14 years ago and she has done very well for most of that time. But over the last year, her symptoms have become much more pronounced and have begun to affect her quality of life. All of us in the family are grateful to live in a time when there are so many supports for people with disabilities, a time of active research into Parkinson's disease. My mom continues to live a full life. I'm grateful that she has the resources she needs to get the help that she needs. One of the difficulties and vagaries of Parkinson's disease is that the symptoms are not always the same. Sometimes a person can walk with confidence. Sometimes they use a walker. Sometimes they need a wheelchair. Sometimes my mother can walk with, with and sometimes even without the walker. Sometimes with a loved one holding her hands and encouraging her. Sometimes every step is difficult. The pathways connecting her desire to walk and the nerves and the muscles in her legs, the pathways connecting those two things is what is disabled with Parkinson's. And like many Parkinson's patients, it is especially difficult for my mother to step through a doorway. Stepping over a threshold is one of the hardest steps she takes. Difficulty walking is called freeze of gait, and it is an active area of research in Parkinson's disease. 80% of Parkinson's patients exhibit freeze of gait. Parkinson's patients report feeling as though their feet are glued to the floor. They want to walk, but they cannot remove their foot from the floor. Verbal cues help, but the patient is often unable to give effective cues to herself. With Parkinson's in a mechanism that is not completely understood, how a person feels about the actions she is taking changes her ability to complete them. There was research done in Europe with Parkinson's patients who were completely immobilized by their disease. But if they were put in a position to do something they loved to do, they were able to do it. So a man who was completely immobilized was put by AIDS on top of a bicycle, a thing he had loved doing, riding his bike. And once on the bicycle, he could pedal the bicycle all over the place, make it go wherever he wanted. And as soon as he was off the bicycle, he was frozen again. And science does not completely understand why this happens or what the different pathways are. But something about joy and love makes it easier for us to move through the world. It's well known that with this freezing, stepping through a doorway is a particularly challenging movement. One NIH study suggests that there is a mismatch between the patient's imagination of how they will move through a threshold and the actuality of completing the movement. All of us, when we look at a doorway ahead of us, we have to plan 
how we'll get through the doorway. Is it big enough for us, for instance? Is there a step? How will we move our bodies through that space? And a Parkinson's patient does that, but when they actually get there, something about the environmental cues around them confuses their motor planning. It's as though they can no longer trust their brain to tell them what's on the other side of the door sill. Holding my mom's hand, standing in front of her, myself backing up while she's walking forward. I'm already on the other side of the door, and I know it's fine. And her rational mind knows that she has stepped through that door from the hallway to the foyer at my brother's house hundreds, thousands of times. Yet the electrons firing between her brain and her muscles tell a different story. What's on the other side? They panic. We can't go there. Not now. As night deepened toward dawn on that first Easter, the disciples also stood on the near side of an impossible threshold. Their beloved rabbi had been killed. Just two days before, they had sat with him at the Seder table, and he had told them to love one another. He told them to keep his teachings alive, but how could they now? The Romans had killed them, killed him. Their own lives were in danger. They knew he was a man of God, and they had hoped against hope that God would step in, that this looming disaster would be avoided at the last minute, like the loaves multiplied or the little girl brought back to life. But not this time his hands and feet broken on the cross, his body lovingly wrapped and hastily buried, his absence unfathomable. This was the threshold his mother and the other disciples started to cross on their way to the tomb that Sunday morning. And all of us have stood on thresholds like this. Lines in the sand that we did not want to cross. Doorways we wished we did not have to step through. I know that each of you has hesitated on just such a threshold and tried to will time not to carry you across. They were thresholds of loss, change, or displacement. Moments where we could not see the future on the other side of that doorway. What ground would hold you? What would be under your feet? What if you walked through and there was nothingness, just a fall and being alone? And then there are the thresholds that all of us face as a people, as a human race on Earth. One of them is the planet's environment. We've just finished the second winter in a row in central Massachusetts where we didn't really ever get cold or snow. Maple syrup ran in February in Vermont. Last year, California experienced the heaviest rains in years while Quebec's forests burned. The war in Gaza is in part a war over water. Haiti's lawlessness is fueled by years of environmental degradation. Every summer hotter. In our personal lives and as people, we wonder if the future is a promise or an abyss. We heard our story about monarch butterflies this morning. They're especially sensitive to changes in global temperature. Deepening cold tells the butterflies in Mexico that it is time to migrate north. Too much rainfall cuts into the time they have to lay their eggs. Climate change reduces the health and availability of milkweed, the caterpillar's only food. Yet unlike us, I can't imagine that the caterpillars are experiencing as existential dread at the prospect of all of this. Their very life cycle requires unimaginable change. I wonder what it's like for them turning into that pupil goo, being deconstructed out of caterpillarness and into the chrysalis and from there into the butterfly. Yet being the goo, fighting off the imaginals imaginal cells, and then finally yielding to their new harmony, struggling to be free of the chrysalis. All of this, all this difficulty, all of this struggle, it's required for the birth of the butterfly. 
As a child, one autumn, my family and I visited Point Pelee National Park in Ontario. As we walked toward the sandy spit of land in Lake Erie, at the edge of which you, where you can see the currents of water pulling in different directions on either side of the sandbar, we noticed the fluttering of the trees in the wind, only they weren't leaves on the trees. They were the downy wings of thousands of monarch butterflies resting on their migration back south from Canada to Mexico. The trees rustled and sang with them. Imagine a world without butterflies, the abyss of a future without that beauty. All of us must step through these thresholds in our lives. Butterflies, goo, imaginal cells, individual people, the human race. There is a world worth being transformed for. We don't exactly know how we'll get there. We may have to lose some comfort, some certainty, some habits along the way. Being in the goo is never comfortable. But the future can be a promise, and we can have hope even through loss. The gospel story is full of terror and amazement at the resurrection of Jesus. We feel as though we are there with the disciples in their grief and then in their wonder. But it is easy to forget that these stories were not written down at the moment they happened. They're narrating a moment, but they were written down 40 to 70 years after the events which they describe. And things got worse for Jesus' community and the Jewish community in Judea as a whole during that time. The temple was destroyed. Jews were exiled from Jerusalem. Rome persecuted Christians in particular, forcing communities to worship in secret under pain of death. And despite all of this, these communities tell us stories and pass down the stories of abundance and connection with the divine. They wrote that Jesus healed people. They recorded that he taught in order to get right with God, humans have to get right with each other. They recorded Mary's testimony that her weeping turned to joy when she recognized her teacher outside his tomb. And then he returned to his friends and gave them peace. That he sent them forth to continue his ministry. That despite all that was lost, all that these people had lived through since that moment, a new promise was gained. Look, they are saying to us, there is a future after all. We thought we had lost everything. But in fact, we gained new life. Death is not the last word. You, too, can be reborn. I take comfort in this message in coping with my mom's illness. Parkinson's disease is degenerative. Although medication is effective and research is ongoing, for the most part, lost abilities will not be regained. A full life becomes a life of adjusting to new futures, a future in a wheelchair, a future with a quieter voice, a future of needing more help. Yet the future holds promise, too. The sweetness of giving and receiving care, the stories yet to tell, the time still to spend together. In my family, we are stepping over the threshold of degenerative illness together, holding each other in love and faith that the future is a promise even though every one of us will someday die. The promise is that the love we have given each other will outlast death. The promise is that our actions are our legacy. Every moment we have to live is a moment to build a future of just and loving action. This is my last Sunday with you before I step away from day-to-day ministry for the next four months. And I have to say, I have no doubts about this little bit of the future. You will be well served by your sabbatical minister, the Reverend Lisa Perry Wood. I bragged to her that I have the best staff and lay leadership of any church anywhere. And I, I can say it because I know it's true. I hope that these few months are a time of growth and possibility for you. We made it out of the pandemic, and now I see that First Unitarian Church is deepening its practice of lay leadership and maturing its organization. 
Committees that weren't sure of their mission and purpose before the pandemic and stopped meeting altogether during the shutdown in some cases have regathered with new energy, new understanding of their role in the church and a new sense of possibility. And I hope that work continues this spring. For my part, I admit that ministry during the pandemic became a routine of solving one problem after another. I don't like an unsolved problem, but I also don't relish seeing ministry as a series of problems to be fixed. Ministry is a joy. It is a celebration. It is walking together. It is the holy work of mourning. It is chasing after the butterfly of the spirit and hoping to keep up. I'm grateful for this opportunity to rest from solving problems and nurture the spark of joy within me. Honestly, I'm also grateful for the opportunity to spend some more time with my family. I just arranged a trip to Michigan to see my parents and my brother yesterday, so I'll be doing that later this month. We have great work to do together, to bring the values of liberal religion to Worcester County, to raise up a new generation of Unitarian Universalists, to invite people into the mission and ministry of the church, to encounter our neighbors where they are and learn how together we can better serve the world. We'll walk apart for a few months and be ready to rejoin this shared ministry in August. I can't wait to hear about the adventures you have this spring. Mary knows the resurrected Christ for who he is when he says her name. In the promise of the future, we will be known as our true selves, seen and held by the Spirit. My mother is herself just as much now as before her diagnosis, just as much in this moment as when she was a working mother of teenagers, just as much as she was facilitating, facilitating trust accounts at the bank where she worked, just as much now that she eats my father's cooking as when she made wonderful meals in the kitchen, just as much as when she was a young bride in New York and a teenager there. The promise of Easter is the promise that we will be known for who we are in the future, that as we cross over the threshold, our souls will remain whole. We will be held and known. We will be loved and empowered even when we can't see where we're going. The future is a promise. I love you all. Amen. Our closing hymn is number 1068 in your teal hymnal, Rising Green. Please rise in body or spirit to sing.
after our benediction, I will invite all our instrumentalists and anyone who wishes to join in the singing, anyone who wishes to join in the singing to come forward and join the choir. And we will all sing and play the hallelujah chorus together. Then I'll invite you to be seated and James will play a postlude on the organ, except if you are of a family with a child, fifth grade or younger, who wants to participate in the egg hunt, during the postlude is your opportunity to go outside ahead of the throng and get out there to the eggs. Uh, the rest of us, I'll invite you to be seated for the postlude until it's over. Now, go forth into the world in peace. Be of good courage. Hold fast that which is good, render to no one evil for evil. Strengthen the faint-hearted, support the weak, help the afflicted, honor everyone. Love and serve the holy, rejoicing in the power of the Spirit forever. Amen. Please be seated or come forward for the Hallelujah Chorus. <laughs> 